you everyone for joining us in this uh, very exciting talk that we're going to have at the Humanities Institute, Stony Brook. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to say that it's virtual because it's actually very real. It's just that it's electronically transmitted. So it's not really a virtual Nikos that we're having. We're having the real thing. And, uh, and we're very pleased for him to have come forward and be willing to share his uh, ongoing work with us and his research. And as uh, director of the Humanities Institute, I just want to let you know about an activity we'll further ado. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the distinguished professor Robert Harvey, who will be in charge of presenting Nikos today. And uh, thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Robert, for making this possible. And uh, you have the word, Robert. Thank you, Adrian. And it's great, <clears throat> great to see you and great to see all of the rest of you there in your little, your little rectangles. So the standard way for me to be doing this would be for me to pronounce a phrase that personally I've always found oddly antifrostic or even bizarrely underhanded with regard to the speaker. Uh, Nikos needs no introduction. Then I would go on to say something like, Nikos Panu is Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature and the Peter V. Tantis Endowed Professor in Hellenic Studies in the Department of English. He received his PhD in Comparative Literature from Harvard University and has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies and the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts at Princeton. Before came in, coming to Stony Brook, he was a visiting assistant professor of comparative literature at Brown. His current research focuses on the ways power and authority were conceptualized and represented in pre-modern philosophical discourse with a particular emphasis on moral and political works written from the 16th century to the 18th century. And he's written on topics ranging from Byzantine, Byzantine historiography to 17th century satire, and has also co-edited a collective volume on conceptions of tyranny from antiquity to the Renaissance, which, is, uh, which was published by Oxford University Press. I would say something like that if I were to say, if I were to introduce it with Nikos needs no introduction, but as the millennials often say, as if. This doesn't do half justice, uh, that this, half of the justice that this, uh, this uh, young man, this whippersnapper deserves. Um, it's as if what I just read was written by him. So what I'd say in addition is that um, whether Nikos is writing on tyranny in Byzantine Empire or delivering a mesmerizing lecture on the supercharged Bacchae or passionately discussing with a colleague, colleague the postmodern staging of Rameau's opera Plate, this polyglot polymath is a treasure. To be, to be regaled by Nikos Panu, a Nikos Panu lecture is, I can assure you, like what it must have been like something that I can remember actually, Some, uh, what it must have been like to watch Muhammad Ali at the height of his power. Or maybe David Bowie in the Ziggy and the uh, Spiders from Mar Mars era. What an exquisite individual he is. Nikos is as kind as he is urbane and as caring as he is brilliant. So without further ado, I'm gonna let him Take up that little, take out that little tiny post note that he usually hangs from the tip of his finger with the two or three notes that he usually needs to give, deliver a 45 minute lecture in, in absolute brilliance. So let us all sit back now and be enthralled by this fellow. Uh, well, um, thank you. Uh, many thanks, Robert, for this, for this. Uh, what can I say, humbling introduction. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Adrian and, um, and Adrienne for uh, the invitation and for making this happen. And of course, thank you all for um, joining us uh, today. 
Um, okay, without further ado, let's hit the road. Um, and I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. I hope you can all hear me and, and I hope you can all see my uh, screen, please. Great, I, I can see some thumbs up. Um, I will start with a problem by means of a general description. After the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate emerged, uh, emerged as an institution officially invested not only with religious, but also judicial, legislative, and even taxing authority. The Patriarch's status was that of a millet basher, an ethnarch would be the closest translation in English. He was called Lord and Despot, there you see him standing next to the Grand Mufti of Constantinople. Uh, he was called Lord and Despot and was endowed with sovereignty and jurisdiction, not only over ecclesiastical and monastic property, but also over the Orthodox peoples of the Ottoman Empire. Nevertheless, what this striking combination of sacred and secular power actually entailed was more of a subservient function that the Greek Orthodox Church was expected to undertake on behalf of the real holders of power. The Sultan and the, uh, the administrative apparatus of the Sublime Port. Essentially, the Church had to keep the Orthodox element of the Empire under control and maintain a functional balance both within the flock itself and in terms of their relationship with their infidel overlords. Having barely survived Byzantium's collapse, the church and its representatives had to learn fast how to navigate a complex and uncharted reality. They found themselves in a remarkable position, inconceivable even in the heyday of Byzantine theocracy, which however entailed having to deal with issues and problems that it had no institutional experience in handling as they had been a concern of secular administrators up to that point. In any case, the incorporation of the Orthodox Church into Ottoman administrative practices is a crucial aspect of its role as an active agent in the socio-political and cultural life of the Balkans throughout the early modern period, which is what concerns me primarily. A number of historical developments and geopolitical imperatives that the Ottoman expansion gave rise to had turned the Balkans, we are right here, of course, in this part of the world, into a region of vital importance, more so than ever before, and the new function of the Greek Orthodox Church could not have resulted but in a concrete and urgent interest in the area. Its rapid integration, direct or indirect, under the supreme rule of a single political authority, the Sublime Port, facilitated considerably the spread of Greek Orthodox influence. And so did the deep Byzantine roots of the Church's presence there. Nevertheless, its new role as both a religious and an administrative institution did not remain uncontested nor was it um, uh, acknowledged and accepted without resistance. On the contrary, it was being complicated, competed and undermined by waves of conflicting local interests or Western aspirations. The Balkans had been an open arena of political strife and religious tension. And in the midst of it all, the Greek Orthodox Church was walking a fine line between the task it had been assigned by its exigent suzerain, on the one hand, and its own needs and agendas, on the other, to say the least. So the question is, how did it all play out for the church and its mission in the precarious world of early Ottoman predominance? What were the methods and mechanisms involved? Are there any patterns discernible here? any underlying ideologies, and what did they entail? What were their means of transmission, consolidation, and reproduction? I guess it's the hardcore Althusserian in me speaking here. 
I will attempt a partial answer today by means of focusing on a single case study, St. Nifon, a celebrated monk and cleric of the period whom you see here bathed in gold. Born in the Peloponnese around 1440, he started his ecclesiastical career as a monk at the Monastery of Virgin Mary in Ocrid, and then moved to the Dionysiou Monastery on Mount Athos. It's a very, very important um, um, uh, part of the Athonite community. He held the key diocese of Thessaloniki for several years, served as ecumenical patriarch twice at the end of the 15th century, one of the first ecumenical patriarchs after the fall of Constantinople, and was appointed shortly thereafter on the metropolitan throne of Wallachia, a strong, prosperous, semi-autonomous semi principality that was very important both in military and in fiscal terms to the Ottomans. His short but crucial presence there reflects the Greek Orthodox Church's interest in that peripheral but strategically located corner of an expanding empire. His activities, as well as their discursive articulation, were primarily designed to consolidate the influence and power of the religious institutions he represented at the expense of internal resistance. As I will try to show, Nifon operated in service of an agenda that sought to inscribe the bonds between Wallachia and the great church within an ideological framework that foregrounded obedience and submission as relational prerequisites. Moreover, this was an agenda that capitalized on a tradition that facilitated the emancipation of local rulers, Wallachian rulers, by means of, by attaching singular political importance to their self-fashioning as protectors and promoters of orthodoxy. Wallachian archons saw a strategic advantage in relying on the great church for the achievement of political legitimacy and vice versa. This was a complex and vital synergy. But how does one become Archbishop of Wallachia in the first place? Indeed, the first non-native Greek-speaking Archbishop of the country after the fall of Constantinople. Nifon's second patriarchate ended as a result of backstage machinations in the patriarchal court, as well as problems with the Ottoman authorities involving taxation of church property. The deposed patriarch, was exiled in Adrianople by order of the Sultan, by Yazid II, where he was confined in the monastery of St. Stephen. Adrianople, by the way, was the second most important city of the, of the empire. It was there that a few years later, he met with a powerful player in the political scene of the period, Radu IV, also known as Radu the Great. Radu Celmare in Romanian. In 503, Radu traveled to Constantinople to pay homage and the annual tribute to Bayezid, and passing through Adrianople, he sought to meet with the exiled prelate who had strong ties with the Wallachian elite, which he had cultivated over the years. Uh, and ended up inviting Nifon to his country as its new archbishop. Tasked, uh, pardon me, charged with the task of reorganizing the Wallachian Church, which after the fall of Constantinople had been thrown into a state of disarray. The expatriarch, the expatriarch accepted the ruler's invitation, and both the patriarchate and the sublime port validated his appointment. As soon as he settled in, in uh, Wallachia, Nifon implemented a series of measures and reforms that revitalized the Wallachian church, <clears throat> pardon me, primarily by means of creating a central administration with a solid network of strongholds, bishoprics, throughout the country. Nevertheless, it was not very long after he had assumed his episcopal duties that he was relieved of them. 
He was deposed in 1505 by order of none other than Radu the Great, who sought to put an end to Nithon's constant interfering in state affairs. The archbishop's persistent and public opposition to the ruler's decisions and policies, among other things, was too much to handle for Radu. Not only did he arrange for Nifon's dethronement, but also proceeded to banish him from the country. The ex-bishop withdrew to the Dionysiu monastery on Mount Athos, where he remained until his death in August 1508. And that's the depiction of his death that you still see at the monastery. You see him right here on his deathbed, flanked, surrounded by mourning, lamenting monks on the one hand, as well as priests on the other, the two aspects of his stellar career, worldly career. And you see the, the, the angel carrying his soul in the form of a, new more, uh, a newborn baby, uh, bringing it to its um, maker. Okay? There, there's uh, another angle, and of course you see the, the place where he was originally buried, um, again bathed in gold. Now, Nifon's case was often given a place, actually a prominent place, in the historical sources of that generally obscure period. Nevertheless, the most seminal text related to his life and career was undoubtedly his vita, his life an extensive hagiography that was written in Greek probably within a few years after his death and subsequent canonization. The author was a certain Gabriel, an Athonite Protos, general superior, about whom very little is known. The original version of his hagiography, of his vita, is lost, almost certainly irretrievably so. Fortunately, Gabriel's text was followed by a Romanian paraphrase, probably through a Slavonic intermediary, as well as by a number of Greek versions, which circulated widely in manuscript form throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Two of those versions, the most substantial ones, will be our point of reference today. This which is the longest Greek, uh, Greek version, translated, uh, pardon me, edited by Vasile Greco in 1944. This is what the first couple of pages look like, and you see the three zones of the text. This is the title and, and first paragraph of the longest Greek, Greek version, with facing Romanian translation by the editor. Then you have the critical apparatus, as well as a shorter Greek version, that the, uh, that the editor uh, provides with, again, the respective Romanian translation. And towards the bottom of the page, you, you have in German translation by the editor, the title and the first lines, right, which go on towards, until the end of the, of the book, of the Romanian version, which was published by Tizi Medrea in the, in the 1930s in an impossible to find uh, book, which, however, has been thankfully reprinted in its entirety in this two-volume collection of old Romanian texts, 1969. And there you have the beginning of the Romanian version of the Vita uh, um, as it looks today. So these are the two uh, most, I think, substantial and most faithful, the closest to the original, uh, uh, versions of the, um, of, the, of the Vita, of Nifon's life, and together I think they provide a fairly good sense of Gabriel's original take lost now on Nifon's life and accomplishments. Radu's meet, so what's, what's, what's happening exactly in the, in the Vita? Radu's meeting with Nifon in Adrianople, his profound admiration for the saintly patriarch, the urgent invitation he extended to him, and his arrangements with the Ottoman and Orthodox authorities are decisively present in all the known versions of the text. Radu, for instance, is presented as acting under the absolute certainty that while in Wallachia, quote unquote, Nifon will become a new apostle destined to save many a soul from the claws of the devil. It is emphatically mentioned that upon his arrival in the country, Nifon found the church, quote, in a state of mess, 
since everyone, the clergy and the laity alike, was given to uncontrollable drinking and eating and all the related indecencies, end of quote. But it is also stated that his first and main concern as the country's archbishop was to summon the demoralized Valachian priests and nobles in a kind of local synod. In doing so, quote, he put them back to order and instructed them to observe the laws and make sure that the people would stop jeopardizing their immortal souls by submitting to impious lechery and despicable gluttony." End of quote. Finally, we learn, and this is my first quote from, for, uh, for tonight, that the, said, the saint said mass every Sunday as well as on feast days so that the people and the ruler himself could go to church and hear him preach. The wonderful prelate spent, spared no effort to detach the Valachians from the evil habit of drunkenness as they had all young and old nobles and magnates succumbed to that vice which give birth to, gives birth to all other vices and deadly sins, especially to abominable and foul lust, as well as to demonic pedophilia, the obscene homosexual practice to which the majority of the people was devoted. Nifon then is depicted as having launched a vehement attack against the moral leprosy of the indigenous population. It is also made clear that no one up to that point had been able to deal with that long-standing and detrimental situation. In the absence of a strong religious figure, the political authorities had proven to be incapable of standing up to such a challenge. It was only through Nifon's excellence, commitment and expertise that, the, that an entire people's decline was finally brought under control. The Archbishop becomes without delay a charismatic leader whose unique skills and qualities are indispensable for the well-being of the community. He had, however, one fundamental condition that everyone in the country, and especially the ruler and his court, who set an example for the masses, will gladly submit to his spiritual guidance. Radu agrees and seems at that point to have been fully aware of the, of the binding character of the agreement. This is his one, you know, one of the things he says in response. From this day on, my father, you are our guide and shepherd lead us to the God, to the law of God. I will rule as far as worldly matters are, are concerned, while your holiness will have uncontested authority over ecclesiastical and spiritual affairs. And whatever you ordain shall be done. Nephon's reply, a brief but charged comment of royal responsibility, articulates his satisfaction with the ruler's public acknowledgement of his obligation to obey, especially when it comes to issues of a religious or moral nature. Prince, I can only praise the sound judgment that you have presently exhibited. I hope that it will remain the same until the end. I also hope that the following caveats will not affect your care and disposition. I must ask you to gladly receive any advice that I might have to offer. And if you are found to be wrong, you must be the first to accept my spiritual guidance. For when the common folk see their ruler submitting to correction and proceeding to repent for his mistakes, they will easily allow themselves to be guided too. On the contrary, if the ruler rebels in church matters, and defies the laws or fails to observe the apostolic commandments, then nothing but decadence and corruption will follow, as it is only to be expected that his subjects will soon give in to evil as well. As a matter of fact, the Romanian version features the most intensive treatment of this particular episode. An extra layer of significance is added here as Nifon declares his terms and expectations in an interminable speech involving 
more so than in any other version, key biblical passages from Exodus, Leviticus, John, and Paul that fortify his programmatic statements by rooting them in the sanctity and infallibility of scripture, which in a, in a sense he embodies and projects. Radu is reminded, for instance, that it was God himself who warned Moses that his law is not to be perverted for anyone's sake, be they, be they poor or rich, lowly or great, or great, widowed or homeless, and that it is therefore proper to rebuke the unrighteous, whoever they might be, with unflinching severity. Similarly, after laying out in detail the irresistible fruits of obedience and submission to his will, boundless peace, success, and prosperity, the God of Leviticus explains viva voce the catastrophe of insubordination. And allow me to, I, I know it's a, it's a little long, but allow me to read it to you. It's pretty intense and, and I think indicative. But if you will not obey me and do not observe my commandments, I shall send drought and famine upon you, and you shall sow your seed in vain, and your enemies shall eat it. And I shall turn my face away from you, and you shall be struck down by your enemies, and they shall rule over you, and you shall flee, though no one pursue, pursues you and I shall make for you the sky like iron and the earth like copper, and all your strength shall be spent in vain, and your land shall not yield its produce, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. And I shall send wild beasts against you, and they shall devour and annihilate you and your livestock, and you shall perish under the sword of all nations that will come upon you, and your land and your courts shall be rendered desolate. And if you turn away from me, I too will turn away from you and abandon you. Nephon continues in this vein and in a way that leaves no doubt as to what is at stake. What follows, however, in the Romanian, as in all other versions, is an abrupt transition that introduces a contrast between this section and the following one, a contrast so pronounced that is clearly intended to provoke shock and indignation. The narrative jumps straight to the point when Radu rejects Nephon's authority and not only acts against his counsel, but also proceeds to have him deposed, marginalized, and eventually thrown out of the country. The texts focus on a single instance of disobedience, one and only. Radu's decision to marry his sister to a Moldavian ally, Bogdan, despite the explicit and adamant veto by the archbishop, who keeps pointing out that Radu's plans are blasphemous, Bogdan, the Moldavian aristocrat, is in no position to marry again as he is already a husband and a father who, driven by political ambition, has abandoned his family and joined forces with a Valachian ruler in doing the unthinkable. It is this friction that triggers the crisis between the ruler and the archbishop, but it is clear that there is a great deal of built up tension that fuels the feud. Nifon ends up excommunicating Bogdan, Radu's sister, and anyone else enabling or, or supporting their sinful union, proceeding to give fiery sermons in front of large crowds against Radu and his despicable behavior. Radu retaliates not only by dethroning Nifon, but also by issuing a decree forbidding his subjects on pain of death to acknowledge the priest's former title and authority, show him the slightest respect, or give him any support and assistance while he remains in the country. But in order to make the point of all this even more clear, the Vita discusses Nifon's dealings with Radu 
in tandem with a very special kind of bond that the Archbishop had developed with another member of the Wallachian elite. Niagoe Basarab, one of the most prominent political figures in pre-modern Romania, whom you see here with, with his firstborn and heir apparent, Theodosius. And this is where the thing gets really interesting, I believe. According to the Vita, Niagoe Basarab was a young noble when he first met Nifon, but by the time Gabriel's text was being composed, probably around 1518, Niagoe had already found his way to the top of the political hierarchy in Wallachia. Although he did not have a rightful claim to the throne, he was propelled to it by his powerful clan, the Krajoveshti boyars, members of which had organized the, member, the murder of Vlad the Young. There's no, there's no known picture of Vlad the Young, but this is what he could have looked like. Uh, like. Radu the Great's brother and legitimate uh, uh, ruler of Wallachia, who had assumed power in 1510, a couple of years after Radu's death. With the legitimate ruler out of the way, Niagoe ascended the throne in 1512 and reigned until his death in 1521, becoming known for, among other things, his ample contributions to orthodox ecclesiastical and monastic centers throughout the Ottoman East. And there it is, typically blonde. You'll see this is a, this is a standard feature of his, of his depictions. Um, uh, and, and again, you see him with his, with his um, firstborn, he had very high dynastic um, aspirations, Niagoe, that is. Now, in the Vita, in, the, in, in, in Nifon's uh, hagiography, Niagoe is repeatedly claimed, again and again and again, and very emphatically, to be Nifon's spiritual child. Spiritual kingship a mutually agreed father-child relationship in God is a loaded notion that is foregrounded in a deep interaction between the spiritual, internal, mystical, charismatic, and institutional, external, official, hierarchical aspect of religion. There is a whole theory behind it which there is no time to go into, into now. But let me just say that the relationship between Nifon and Niagoe, as described in the Vita, reflects the theory of spiritual kingship with telling precision. What binds them together is an intimate union that on a functional as well as an emotional level necessitates Nifon's unfailing guidance and supervision, on the one hand, as the father, and, and Niagoe's gratitude, obedience, and dependence, on the other, as the child. This special bond is presented in sharp contrast to the preceding altercation with Radu, the Wallachian ruler. While Radu exhibits abysmal disloyalty to the Archbishop and everything he represents, and is left to wither away in a graceless state of fallacy, Niagoe surrenders to the Holy Prelate with fanatic determination. In turn, the latter grants him his blessing as well as the opportunity to grow in Christ by means of continued obedience and zealous devotion, even in his absence, even after he had left the country. What I will try to show in the second half of my talk is that by emphasizing Niagoe's attachment to Nifon, the Vita, which was probably commissioned to Gabriel by Basarab himself, was contributing to the ruler's own agenda for monarchical emancipation. In doing so, however, it was also granting to Nifon, if only retrospectively, a considerable amount of spiritual and political power over the country, over Wallachia and its people. It is that vital synergy I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, and I can now be more specific. 
All the extant versions of the Vita give a prominent place to a series of events that marked Niagoe's reign a few years after Nifon's death and are actually indicative of the way the Valachian voivod perceived or strived to present himself as a moral and political entity in relation to the ex-archbishop. In 1515, and we are, what, seven years after Nifon's death, Niagoe officially requested the exhumation of Nifon's earthly remains and arranged for their translation from the Dionysiu monastery on Mount Athos, where they had been kept and venerated since his death, to Wallachia, to his country, in a sort of expiatory ceremony on behalf of his deceased predecessor, Radu the Great, who had ordered the, arch the archbishop's dethronement and deportation. The ceremony took place at the Dealu monastery, uh, which you see here, and this is a closer look. I'm not going to go any closer because there is an AC unit right here that breaks my heart every time I, um, I see it. So the ceremony took place at the Dialu Monastery, founded by Radu himself. There you see him in one of the walls of the monastery as the founder of the place, right, who was actually buried there. There is his uh, uh, marble tomb, and there is what's left of him today, the, the, his skull photographed in an early 20th century anniversary ceremony next to the skull of the second founder of the, of the Dialu Monastery, Mihai Viteazul. Nifon was canonized, he was sanctified, and the holy relics were returned to their host monastery on Athos in a valuable, church-shaped reliquary that Niagoe had commissioned specifically for the occasion. And here's the, the Niagoe's reliquary. This is a better black and white um, image with greater detail. And you can see that it's still a central, a focal point in the, in the religious life of the monastery. People go and pay, you know, tribute to it uh, uh, very, very often. And this is what it looks like when it is opened. Missing from the relics were the saint's skull and right hand, which Basarab kept and publicly venerated throughout his life. And they are still very important relics for Romanians. I should say that Nifon is almost a national saint for the, for the Romanians. There you see his, uh, his right hand and his skull. And this is a photograph taken from the consecration of, his, of the new reliquary that you see here of his uh, skull and right hand last summer in the Craiova uh, Cathedral. This is the Romanian um, uh, archbishop. Two years later, two years after his Two years, two years uh, uh, after all this, Nifon's canonization was ratified by the Constantinopolitan Synod and it took a spectacular event to provide the suitable context for the final act in a drama of penitence and glorification, namely the consecration of one of Niagoe's most impressive foundations. Here you see him as the, fo the, the founder with his family of the superb cathedral at Curtea de Arges. If you see, it's exactly the same, the same building. Right? And there's a closer look. It's one of the most impressive specimens of, I don't even know how to put it, of syncretic Balkan Baroque in the, in the, in the, in the early modern period. Um, the consecration ceremony of, of the cathedral, which was combined with a grand celebration of Nifon's canonization, took place on August 15, 1517, uh, the ecumenical patriarch himself, Theolyptos I, presided at the ceremony, accompanied by several important metropolitans, as well as the archimandrites and abbots of all the Athenite monasteries, all of them guests of the ruler, Niagoe Basarab. Gabriel, the author of the original Vita, was certainly one of those who were invited to the consecration ceremony in his capacity as the Athenite um, uh, protos. And my theory is that there you have it, you have a very suitable context for the commission of the hagiography of the Vita to Gabriel by Basarab himself. 
these events were not merely incorporated in the Vita, but they are actually emphasized as much as possible in all the extant versions. To start with, they are discussed in conjunction with a famous event in the early history of Byzantium, when in 437 CE, the Emperor Theodosius II arranged for the relics of Saint John the Chrysostom to be brought back to Constantinople in order to atone for his dead mother's sins. Chrysostom had died exiled in Cucuzus, and it was Theodosius' mother, the Empress Eudoxia, who had managed to secure his banishment by means of silencing the bitter criticism he had publicly, primarily through his homilies and sermons, launched against her. And, and here you see him attacking uh, Eudoxia uh, with all his rhetorical vehemence. As it happened, however, very soon after Chrysostom's second banishment and subsequent death, Eudoxia suffered a fatal miscarriage, which was commonly interpreted as a sign of divine punishment for her opposition and hostility to the Archbishop of Constantinople. Thus, in the Vita, the, the equivalences are laid out pretty clearly. Nephon is, of course, the new John Chrysostom, a divine agent invested with the power to reveal God's will to his contemporaries, regardless of their social status. Radu, on the other hand, fatally repeats the mistake of Eudoxia, who by persecuting God's messenger, exposed the state herself, the state and its people, to grave risk and paid with her life for her impious behavior. And finally, Neagoe lives up to the standard set by Theodosius, the pious Byzantine emperor, who went to great lengths in order to save his people from certain doom. Within that context, the narrative in, in the Vita assumes a distinctly dramatic character, and the return of Nephon's relics to Valachia is invested with striking metaphysical dimensions. Here I shall only refer to a couple of passages from the Greco version, the, long, the longest Greek version. The first passage is characteristic, I think, in its description of the cataclysmic misfortunes that befell Radu and Valachia very soon after the persecution and banishment of the country's spiritual leader. The tokens of divine disapproval are reminiscent of Nephon's references earlier in the Vita to the merciless punishment that God reserves for those who refuse to obey. Let's read. After the Sensdor mission, Radu, the Valachian voivod, came down with a dreadful and incurable disease. His entire body was covered in holes emitting an unbearable stench, to the extent that one could hardly come close to him. In addition, grave scandals broke out among his courtiers, and ever since the blessed Nephon was expelled from Valachia, the church trembled with confusion and disorder. Great famine, droughts, disasters, and ha and, and hurricanes befell the country, and for that reason, the ruler had repeatedly looked everywhere for the scent, even while the latter was still alive. For it was commonly known that all these plagues and calamities were sent by God, because the scent had been banished. As for Prince Radu, he died in great pain and distress, and everyone was terrified and brought the scent to mind. The second passage is equally interesting in its almost theatrical depiction of the miraculous restoration of harmony and order due to Neagoe Basarab's sense of duty and loyalty to his spiritual father, a loyalty that is manifested in the ruler's determination to correct his predecessor's wrongdoings. 
We are at that point in the text where Niagoya has just succeeded after sustained efforts to have Nifon's relics translated from Athos to Valachia. Having welcomed the saint's body with a passionate embrace and a shower of tears and insatiable kisses, he organizes a magnificent procession and carries the relics on his shoulders all the way to, the, to Dealu Monastery, Radu's foundation, where he deposits them right on top of his grave. Later on, he attends a vigil in the sense honor and dozing off, he has a dream, a dream. Late at night, while they were keeping vigil over the saint's relics, Niagoe fell asleep by the shrine. In a state of rapture, he saw that Radu's grave broke open, exposing his pitch black corpse, horrendously polluted, polluted, emitting a strong stench and discharging pus from all over. The pious ruler could not bear that despicable sight and begged the saint to show mercy to that wretched Radu. At once he saw something like a font or fountain rising from within the shrine and Nifon himself thoroughly washing Radu's body. And by the time the cleansing was over, the fetid and deformed corpse was glowing with purity and beauty. The first thing that should be noted here is that the repeated juxtaposition of Radu's rotten disintegration with the aromatic revelation of Nifon's body when it was first exhumed in Dionysiu upon Basarab's request becomes at this point overwhelming. The reader, and I will explain what I mean in a second, the reader cannot help returning to that point in the story when the Athonite monks do not dare dig up the saint's grave because they are terribly afraid to do so. But one of Niagoa's emissaries, a great Valachian boyar, is so certain that they are doing the right thing that he, and that he will not be harmed in disturbing the saint's peace that he rushes forth with spade in hand. And when he approached the holy relics, O oh, your ineffable mysteries, Lord Jesus Christ, the entire area was flooded with an indescribable scent and everyone marveled. And having lifted the relics, they put them in a casket and brought them to the middle of the temple and the, and, and the entire church was filled with inexpressible fragrance. Although brief, this scene leaves no doubt as to Nifon's blessed status that turns even mortal decay into olfactory bliss. This is a status that implies a very particular kind of divine endorsement. The earthly scent that emanates from his unearthed remains Pardon me, the unearthly scent that emanates from his unearthed remains is the odor of sanctity. On the other hand, Radu bears the seal of damnation. The erosive malady that claimed his life keeps tormenting him long after his demise, and the narrative reflects that toxic symmetry before and after his death by replicating the previous description of his horrendous death in the oniric manifestation of his ravaged body. Now, however, the curse is neutralized by means of Niagoya's supplication that provokes the sense pity and miraculous intervention. But if the blasphemer's remains have been graced with a sense forgiveness, the body politic should also be saved from the chaos that an unruly ruler has thrown it into. In order to make the meaning of Neagoe's vision as clear as possible, the text has its cathartic symbolism extend almost instantly into reality, onto reality itself. 
The very next morning, we are told, a large crowd has gathered outside of the church where Nephon's relics are kept. The hordes of afflicted believers who have traveled there from every corner of Wallachia are a reflection of the dismal state the country has fallen into. They too become grateful recipients of the saints' therapeutic blessing. I read, in the morning a liturgy was performed and many Valachians, men and women, gathered from the provinces, bringing with them countless invalids. After the service was over and having obtained the ruler's permission, they kissed the scent with faith and tears in their, in their eyes and they all received their much desired health back. Cripples were able to stand again on their feet. Those afflicted with fever recovered, and everyone who came to pay homage to the saint in sincere faith was cured of almost any kind of disease. Read through the lens of the earlier section in the Vita, where the newly arrived Archbishop explains his terms and conditions to Radu, uh, we talked about it, we discussed it uh, a few minutes ago. These passages are enough, I think, to indicate that the disastrous events that Nephon's expulsion had activated were practically caused by Radu's audacity not to submit to the Archbishop's instructions regarding his sister's marriage, an issue that evidently fell under the latter's jurisdiction. Radu's disobedience was illegal and blasphemous because by defying the hierarch's will, he was essentially violating a sacred agreement between his country and the great church. Once the responsibility for the moral guidance of the Wallachian people was placed in Nephon's hands, both the ruler and by extension his subjects were expected to submit to the archbishop's religious and judicial authority. The observance of these terms would secure the prosperity of the country at the same time as sa sanctioning Radu's reign by asserting the legitimacy of his temporal power. Thus, as I see it, the conflict between Radu and Nephon should be understood as the result of a struggle over power and jurisdiction. Were the prince's matrimonial plans for his sister a matter of diplomacy or morality, a question of politics or religion? Did such a problem pertain to the temporal or the spiritual domain of the state? Should it have been handled by the palace or the church? Who will decide? Who will ordain? Who will speak the law? Who, after all, is better equipped to serve the country and its people as its divinely sanctioned leader in an economy of salvation? The secular administrator or the spiritual leader? These are precisely the questions that underlie the electrified conversation between Radu and Nephon, right on the verge of the official break of their relationship. The voivod is furious at the archbishop's opposition to his political plans and confronts him accordingly. I read, It is not right for you, bishop, to be such a severe judge of me and my people. On the contrary, you should be fearful and reserved in your dealings with sovereigns. In fact, I have been meaning to mention this ever since I brought you to this country. You have been indifferent and disrespectful to all our traditions and customs. And like a madman, you expect everything to conform to nothing but your own view of things. Therefore, from this day onward, we do not want your guidance, nor the traditions and customs you represent. For we are men of the world, and we simply cannot submit to your will. Nephon responds by making it clear, by making clear what it is that Radu is going against and what the consequences will be, not only for him personally, but for the country as well. Quote, 
Alas, I see clearly now that great wrath will fall on you and everyone else in this country. I feel sorry for your souls. You should know, Prince, that my power and authority is grounded in the law of the church for which my Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood in order to cleanse it from sin and sanctify it. Thus, the church shall always be pure and holy in carrying out the divine rules, which I too long to observe until the end of my days. Radu epitomizes a medieval conception of sovereignty that afforded the ruler a dual power, both secular and spiritual. That conception of sovereignty had reached the, the Danubian principalities through Byzantium around the 14th century and had become the standard way for Wallachian and Moldavian rulers to perceive themselves as state leaders. The voivod ruled by the grace of God and that granted him absolute power over his subjects and allowed him to rule self-sufficiently. And these are, these are the exact terms that are used in the royal decrees of the period. The ritual of prostration before him was an acknowledgement of his sacred status, which was achieved through the religious ceremony of coronation, during which anointment with holy oil played a key role as it transferred divine grace upon the ruler and cemented the divine nature of his power, making it both theocratic and charismatic. Thus, the ruler becomes a representative of God on earth who imitates the way the supreme and eternal king rules the cosmos and diffuses his grace into the material world. As such, however, he can also claim privileged status and authority vis-a-vis -vis the church. This was a huge debate in the late centuries of Byzantium. But this understanding of sovereignty, which foregrounds the lay leader's supremacy and legitimizes his predominance over both state and church, puts what Nifon represents and brings to Wallachia, an institution that by that time claimed not only spiritual, but also secular, administrative power in a position of compromising inferiority that borders on irrelevance. It is not accidental that despite the voluntary invitation he extends to Nifon and his original willingness to share power and jurisdiction with him, at the slightest prospect of ambiguity as to who is in charge, Radu resorts to resistance, intransigence, and rebellion in a kind of reflex withdrawal into autocratic absolutism. Thus, the Vita comes in to offer a way out of the conundrum. Radu disrupts the cosmic order by defying Nifon's will, which is really God's will. The Archbishop is God's agent. He is representative par excellence, the person who is in a better position than anyone else to fathom, implement, and uphold divine law, which supersedes and transcends human needs and concerns. The consequences of Radu's blindness are as inevitable as they are ferocious. They also take a lot of effort and energy to reverse, and that only under very special circumstances and with the intervention of the right kind of people. At the very least, what is required is an unambiguous acceptance and acknowledgement of guilt. Radu is unable to perform that necessary gesture of penitence as he has already paid with his life for his criminal conduct. Niagoe Basarab, on the other hand, can act on the latter's behalf, not only in his role as Nifon's loyal spiritual child, but also as the person who is now in the same position of power and responsibility that Radu occupied. He is the head of the state. And as such, 
he can intervene and act on behalf of the Wallachian people too. Operating within a Davidic conception of kingship, Niagoe assumes full responsibility for the collective sin that is polluting the community and manages to resolve an otherwise uncontrollable situation through drastic acts of piety and devotion, all the way from tears to ceremony. By exhibiting a liberating combination of humility, obedience, acceptance and repentance, he is able to prove the Christian legitimacy of his power, not only within his territory, but also within the Orthodox Commonwealth, as controlled and regulated by the ecumenical patriarchate, which, as we are told in the Vita, observes him approvingly in everything he does. In that sense, Niagoe arrives via Nifon to a deeper understanding of concepts such as sovereignty and jurisdiction, which he adopts and enacts, having inserted them into the proper frame of reference. What Gabriel's Vita offers is the portrait of a model ruler who embraces gladly and willingly what the historian Daniel Barbu has seen as the defining characteristic of religious experience in pre-modern Romania. And I'm quoting him in my translation. Romanian orthodoxy was more of a political and, ju and juridical nature than of a purely religious one. It was not based on faith in a God of redemption, but on a demand for conformity to a set of moral norms. It did not call for participation, but for submission. For Romanians, orthodoxy was less of a personal faith and more of an essential law. And this is very, very, very special to me and more of an essential law designed to organize and govern the body politic of the nation." End of quote. And I'm coming to a close here. It does not come as a surprise that the Vita draws attention to the fact that by means of his devotion to his patron saint and the precepts of the church, the essential law that Nifon embodies, Niagoe has mastered the true meaning of sovereignty thereby becoming an ideal ruler in every respect. Among other things, I'm not going to read you the passage, I'm just going to uh, summarize it. Among other things, Nifon is compared to Abraham and Samuel in such terms that Basarab is inevitably linked to Melchizedek and David, the archetypal royal figures of the Old Testament. His reign observes and promotes the right order of things, and is therefore divinely sanctioned and protected. That is what makes him invincible. We have, of course, another eloquent portrait of this paragon of royal virtue in the lid of the reliquary that Neagoe commissioned for Nifon's remains. The ruler has himself depicted on the inside of the container's cover gaining thus uninterrupted proximity to the epicenter of holiness, the saint's fragrant relics. He is kneeling in front of Nifon in supplication and devotion, a posture that also finds its rightful prominent place in the Vita, where the reliquary and its painted lid are described adoringly. Both in its pictorial and in its textual manifestations, Neagoes Deisis supplication is revealing, I think, in terms of the relational dynamics, the dialectic of closeness and submission uh, it, seeks, it establishes between the prince and the sanctified prelate. In fact, at least two more such visual statements reproduce the same pattern. A lost icon commissioned by Neagoe for the Grand Church in Targoviste he had dedicated to Saint Nifon, and this icon preserved at Dionysiu on Mount Athos and surely commissioned by Basarab himself as well. They all share a visual language 
that is explicit in its symbolism, at least as far as I am concerned. A frontal, severe, otherworldly Nifon rises dominant in the middle of the scene, a perfect mediator between the supreme king of the cosmos and his earthly representative. He is holding firmly a closed, a closed copy of the gospel that sits conspicuous but remote in his left hand. The otherwise inaccessible grace of the divine word is processed through the sense body covered in priestly vestments, tokens and emblems of institutional authority. It is diagonally transferred to his right hand with which he extends a sign of blessing, approval and protection to an entreating Neagoe. The ruler, the ruler is kneeling piously by the saint's side. He is crowned and richly clad, but also considerably smaller in size and power than the hallowed prelate. Like the Vita itself, these visual statements were part of a propagandistic program designed to emphasize the kind of relationship that the Valachian ruler sought to establish vis-a-vis -vis Nifon, whom he adopted as his spiritual father and patron saint. In essence, what is really at stake here, one of the things that are really at stake here, is the dubious legitimacy of, monarch, of Basarab's monarchical power, which, let's not forget, had been achieved in circumstances involving usurpation and bloodshed. Niagoe's moral and political identity was redefined through his strongly accentuated bond with a sanctified priest who had been persecuted by Radu the Great, a prominent member of the clan from which Basarab had illegally appropriated the throne. In the right light, even usurpation can turn out to be not an illegitimate and condemnable act of force, but a justifiable and necessary intervention aimed at the restoration of order and the restitution of power to more fitted hands. I'm almost done. But can you do this on your own? Not easy. And this is when Nifon steps in, not just as a saintly individual, but as a representative of an ancient and sacred institution that you need, you need, you need, whether you want it or not. Nifon absorbs, merges and projects the tensions and imperatives of two different worlds, those rival realms of temporal becoming and spiritual being. And what this dual citizenship entails, I think, is indicative of crucial and uneasy changes that the role and function of the Greek Orthodox Church was undergoing in the aftermath of Byzantine annihilation. Thank you. And apologies if this took <laughs> longer than intended. That's great, uh, Nico. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Here, let me put a, since we're using Zoom, I just put a little, whoop. I put the wrong reaction. We have little reactions down below. Here we go. I'll give you a little applause thing. I don't know whether it comes through or not. Oh, yeah, there we go. You see my little applause thing on my, on my yeah, window? Yeah, we can actually applaud. Uh, open your mics if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like it. Would be. I don't know. I like I just figured that since we're in the medium, I have to, I have to uh, use, use it to the hilt. Yes, excellent. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, a little bit of time for, for, for questions um, and hopefully answers. I, I, I assume there will always be answers from Nikos about any questions that we might have. Um, I, from anyone, I, and, and please do as I ask my students to do, just turn your mics on and interrupt if you want you don't have to raise your hand I, I mean I, I would have maybe maybe they're kind of facetious well the first one's definitely a facetious question the question would be but you can answer it if you'd like when when is the Netflix series coming out <laughs> uh, no it's but if you don't want to answer that question because it does I mean it does really really sound like it would be you know you could write the scenario I could envision eight episodes uh, on Netflix, um, 
anyway, but that, so if you want to touch that one, you can. The other question I have is maybe it's probably as facetious as well, but it does, um, it has, I, mean, I hope it has a little bit more seriousness behind it. And that would be, um, it took a while before, because I was looking for all the sin and the sex. I was looking for all, you, you can hear me okay, can't you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, because I have low batteries on my, on my, on my headset here. Um, and, and it finally came when, there, when you gave that quote uh, with, uh, I believe it was St. Nephon condemning, uh, or maybe it was somebody else, but condemning the, uh, the what was it, the indecencies of yeah. eating and drinking. I knew that sex was coming quickly because eating and drinking were preceding it. Uh, and, the, and, and the sex came in this form of obscene homosexuality. But my question is not about homosexuality, it's, it's about... Um, I guess reproductive sex, you might want to call it. And the question has to do with the, so, so Nigoya Basarab is the, took himself for, or is the spiritual leader of Nifon. And maybe I didn't catch it, but their lives intersect. Is that correct? Their lives intersect? Yes. Yes. So they, they, they so there's, is there no possibility whatsoever that, Nifon is more than just a spiritual father? I mean, could he be the father of Nigoya? The father? The father? No, no way. We know his father. We absolutely know who his father was. But this, the thing is that, and, and, and Nifon, of course, as, as a very high ranking cleric, was, uh, at least as far as we can tell, childless. Um, and there's not, there's, there's, there's no indication, as far as I I, I know, that, that you know Niagoy was was his his uh, his child. Niagoy, when he when he usurped the throne, Niagoy was a Kayoveshti. His last name was a Kayoveshti. He was uh, you know a very well known member of the Kayoveshti clan, and uh, as we know, the um, the, um, the 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 Valakian, um, um, how should I put it? dynasty, the, Van the Valachian su succession to the throne, was only accessible to two clans, right? The Draculeshti clan and the Doneshti clan. Right? Radu, Vlad the Young, most of the, most of the, of the, um, of the rulers of Valachia at that period were prominent members of the Draculeshti clan. They are, they, they are all relatives of, Dra of Vlad Chepes, the Dracula as he was immortalized in Bram Stoker's novel, right? Mm. So yeah, right. Uh, Basarab did not have access, right, to the, to the line of succession, right, uh, as a Krayoveshti. So what does he do? They get rid of, the, of Vlad the Young, right? not he himself, but his associates, his relatives. They arranged for his, for his, they attack him and they decapitate him. And very soon after he ascended the throne, he forges his genealogy. And he claims, and he keeps claiming that throughout his reign, that he was the actual son, not of his real father, but of, you know, a very prominent member of the Draculeshti clan, therefore a Basarab. <laughs> and interestingly, of course, in the Vita itself, there is no mention of, of his Cryoveshti origins. He is Basha, he is a Basarab to the bone, right? And there is no doubt as to the as to the legitimacy of his uh, of his uh, accession to the throne. But he himself knew that he had to do better than that. He had to do better than just forging his genealogy. And that's why I think Nifon and his vindication plays a very important role. Because you see what happens, right? Nifon was 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 persecuted by Radu, right? Uh, Radu's brother was the one who was murdered in the hands of the Krayovesti boyar so that Niagoy could become the ruler. And of course, if you are, try if you are able to prove right, that you are, you are in a better position to rule the country because you show the proper respect to the, to the, to the, to the ex-archbishop, then there you have it, propaganda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting stuff. Sure, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Celia. Uh, I have a question, if I may. 
Uh, thank you so much, Nikos. It was great to listen to you. And throughout the whole talk, I kept, uh, I kept asking myself, what is the Sultan here? Uh, ah, yes. I know that you have said that it's a semi-autonomous region, uh, but it still is uh, it's a very peculiar period because from the point of view of the Ottoman Empire, what the Sultan is doing is creating some kind of a benevolent or pragmatist uh, tolerance to other religions. You know, it's, like, it's, a, it's kind of a first uh, experiment in modern uh, pragmatist uh, pseudo, uh, you know, diversity. <laughs> for God, yes. something like that. Like, so it's the same period in which the, the Sultan is admitting, you know, the Jewish people that are fleeing Spain, uh, the, you know, it's, it's around the same years. And you have this kind of highly medieval authoritarian in the sense of, you know, authorities really, like who, who, has, who has the interpretation of the original text uh, and has right to it, emerging almost uncontested and is clearly, I mean, you have explained very clearly how it's possible, but I was wondering whether it's also a response to this, you know, to the Sultan's position that is actually taking a different direction, I think. Yeah, I, that's, that's, that's a, a crucial aspect of my, of my analysis and of my reading of the, of the, of the Vita and of Nifon's case. I, I, it would have required at least one more hour to just talk about it, so I decided to to uh, to leave it out completely. But give me one one minute to just read you this this passage, and it's just an example. Right? It happened one day that on his way back to the patriarchate from a church in the city where he had been invited to perform the service, the saint was met unexpectedly with the emperor of the Turks. He greeted him properly, giving him priority of passage. Seeking in his arrogance to be treated like a god, the sovereign offended the saint, claiming that he does not know how to honor and pay tribute to kings. The humble saint did not utter a word and left thinking to himself, this too is your work, sly Satan. Having returned to the palace, which is, of course, the Seraglio, a few days later, the emperor exiled the saint to Adrianople and had him guarded by soldiers. During his, the trip there, those infidels harmed him repeatedly and showed him nothing but contempt, and the saint begged God to keep him safe from their abuses. Right? Why, is this in, why is this passage very interesting to me? It's, it's one of the things that enabled me to build an entire theory uh, um, uh, uh, about the, um, the, 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 the role and the place that has been reserved to, uh, to, you know, to the Sultan and the Sublime Port within the very confusing context of the post-Byzantine period. First of all, the term that he's using in the text, right, for the, for the Sultan is not Sultan, it's not the Padishah or anything like that, it's the Emperor, the Basileus of the Turks, right? And the, uh, and the, the Basileus is a very charged, very loaded volume because it's the, it's the title that had been traditionally and exclusively reserved for Byzantine emperors, right? During the last centuries of Byzantium, I think I mentioned it very briefly in my talk, there was a huge class between the church, the patriarch, and the emperor, right, over power and jurisdiction, right? It was, it's what the great French historian Gilbert d'Agron has called Caesar, Caesar of papism, right? Who, who, who is responsible really for the, for the, for the, for the state? Who is better equipped to, uh, to, to be a legitimate decision maker? My theory is that after the fall of Constantinople, this clash, between the Byzantine emperor and the Byzantine uh, um, uh, patriarch has become irrelevant. It has been dissolved into the magma of Ottoman predominance, right? Because the, 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 the Ottoman Sultan is out there, he's an infidel, he's beyond reach, and he's really in power. And the passage that I had read you to my mind indicates precisely that throughout the text, the Turks are treated as they really were. They were there all the time, but there was never any competition between them 
between the patriarch and the sultan over power and jurisdiction. The old late Byzantine competition right, has shifted, right? Be, and, and it has become an issue all of a sudden, right, between the Patriarchate in Constantinople and all those semi-independent local Balkan ru ru rulers, right, all of which needed to be kept under control, all of which were very interested in fashioning themselves as successors to the late Byzant to the to the Byzantine emperors, right. So the only time, the only time, and it's amazing how passive and stoic and silent and weak Nifon is when it comes to, to, uh, to, to the hubristic right, arrogance and punishment of, of the Sultan. And you have to compare this, I think, right, um, with, with the way he's, you know, he's dealing with Radu and with Nergoe, a hapless opponent on the one hand and a spiritual child on the other. As opposed to the to the to the the great Padisha, who is simply he is so beyond good and evil that even even the even the the, the superpowers of a saint <laughs> cannot prevent him from from punishing him and ex, and exiling him in Adrianople. Okay, does Is this make it, sense? Helia Jumpin. Yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, first of all, I just want to agree with Robert's sentiment that this would be a great. Uh, mini series. I can see watching this on on Netflix quite easily. Um, Nikos, I was thinking about genre as I was listening to your talk because first of all, I was thinking, well, it shouldn't be called a vita; it's a vitae, right? Because there's multiple lives really being written in this text. And then I started wondering, well, what are the um, genres that are available to the secular leader? And you showed some toward the end, right? You showed the interior of the reliquary, and you also showed the other um, image, you know, which is very similar. But I wondered in terms of textual produ productions, yes. you mentioned royal decrees, but it seems to me that's probably not going to have the staying power that Avita does. So are there other kinds of genres that um, a secular leader might employ um, in order to present themselves in the light that you showed here? That's, that's another great question. And it, it, again, it's, it, it's, it's intricately, um, it, it plays a key role in my, in my full discussion of, the, um, of, of, of Nifon's case. And I will mention only two examples, uh, two other genres, let's put it that way, two other discursive uh, uh, articulations of power of uh, monarchical power, let's put it that way, that were available to Neagoy Basarab. One of them is the spectacular, the uh, uh, simply mind-blowing engravings in Old Church Slavonic that literally cover the entire facade of the cathedral at Curtia de Arges that I, uh, that I uh, uh, showed you. It was where the, the consecration, the ratification of Nifon's um, um, canonization took place in 1517. Those texts, and, and, and of course it's, it's like Odyssey, it's an immense, it's a continuous text in the forms of, of, of inscriptions in Old Church Slavonic, which was the formal official language of Wallachia at that point. They are simply, I mean, it's just impossible to summarize here, but it's, it's a prominent vehicle of monarchical ideology. And again, you see how closely related it, it is, right, to, 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 to Neagoa's self-fashioning as a promoter, as a defender of orthodoxy. They cover the facade of the church. Right? Where in fa and and Nifon is mentioned again and again, as well as many, many other things that, um, um, that are part of, let's put it that way, Niagoe's ideological propaganda at that point. The other, of course, um, genre, and this is the biggest can of worms of them all, is Niagoe's political testament. The, the, the famous Invatsatsurile in Romanian, the teachings of Neagoe Basarab to his son Theodosius. It's essentially, it's almost like a mirror for princes. It's a, it's a manual of political conduct and, and, and moral edification addressed to his son and successor Theodosius, right? Now, suffice it to say, of course, 
the text has been traditionally attributed to Neagoi Basarab, right? Uh, he's supposed to be the author for centuries, but we are in a position to know now, although it is debated and there are some hardcore Romanian fanatics who still doubt it, but that's okay, that the text was written in Basarab's voice by none other than Manuel of Corinth, the great, lo the grand logothete of the ecumenical patriarchate, who was Neagoe Basarab's closest, um, uh, how should I put it, advisor on issues of a doctrinal and judicial nature. And all of a sudden, you have a, 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 a very high ranking representative of the patriarchate writing a manual on how to be an ideal Valachian ruler, on what it entails to be the perfect, most successful, most effective uh, 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 voivod, right? Which, again, I, I, I don't think I need to say more. You see how, to put it, to put it in, 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 again, in Althusserian terms, you see not only how you have a very strong, you have some very strong ideological apparatuses at play here, right? But the main agents themselves secure their reproduction again and again and again, especially if you take into consideration the very substantial Nachleben, the afterlife, not only of the different versions of Sense Vita, but, on, but also and primarily of Nifo of Neagoes in Vatsatsurile. Neagoe's political testament. The very fact that they had such a wide distribution and such a wide manuscript trans transmission, uh, practically until the 19th century, indicates that they were read widely and they were used again and again as ideological points of references, uh, points of reference, in very different chronologies, in very different contexts, and for very different uh, reasons, some of which I discussed in my in the, re in the relevant chapter of my book. Laura Dana has a question. Yeah, can I jump in there? And nice to see you, Nico, and, and thank thanks, you. by the way, for having me in this. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this. Um, I, I have two questions, one that probably would take us too far, but I think needs to be part of the Netflix series, because you would have to frame all of this into also this fantastic history of the book aspect, where you have this lost original and then all these different versions and I would be fascinated but as I said this may take us too far perhaps to understand how those different versions then you know with multiple languages and, and multiple voices address different audiences so if we're thinking about the ideological um, dimensions of these texts of course changing those readerships and addressing different publics would also come into that but the the one that's really more urgent for me is I couldn't help, so you were using, you, one of your key, key concepts with this was this question of equivalence. And you gave us the story of how St. John's Chrysostom's uh, story gets then paralleled with what happens um, with Radu and Nagoya and, and Nifon. And I couldn't help thinking um, at Auerbach Classics um, mm. discussion of figura and, and of course, you know, the, the ultimate figure is, is Christ himself, but then there's a whole series when in, in our works reading of Dante in particular, of the way in which the relationships, again, with the emperor and the relationship between secular and spiritual power is also read through figura. So I was wondering whether your notion of equivalence, in a sense, has a parallel with, with that tradition of representation. And, and of the prefiguration and figuration yeah. of, of representation across historical uh, and spiritual realms. Uh, and that in itself also is linked in my head. I, I have for a while been thinking about the way in which figura is also a form and the, and the figure itself of translation. And translatio, of course, is both literal translation yeah. and the translatio yes. as in, in the, relics. The, you know, what you, of relics as you were discussing. So there's a real intersection here for me. I did it on purpose, the translation, of course, and you're absolutely right. And, and to put it in a nutshell, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. The figura, the prefiguration, the, uh, all, 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 all the things that you mentioned were uh, played a very important role in Byzantine hagiography as a genre. And of course, what we have here I would call it post-Byzantine, right? But essentially, it, it, it is still written within the, 
the generic conventions, within the, the mentalities, within the, 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 the stereotypes and expectations of late Byzantine hagiographical literature, right? So you, it, it happens all the time, and not just with John Chrysostom uh, and, and Theodosius and Eudoxia. Uh, with any, any, how should I put it, any equivalence that they can establish that would make it easier for, for readers to contextualize things, to situate things, to interpret things, to put them in perspective, they would do it. And they did it. And, and, and it becomes, again, it becomes a feature of, uh, of, of post-Byzantine um, uh, hagiography uh, for at least a couple of centuries after the fall of Constantinople. Yeah. Thank you. And also, I should say one more thing, they, um, I, because I'm also very interested in, in that. Um, they, they reverse those, uh, those figuras, especially when, mm -hmm. they, especially when it comes, for instance, to a very special type of sins, the fools in Christ, the salos, right, which is a very special group, family of, uh, 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 of sins, which, you know, pretend to be crazy, pretend to be um, blasphemous and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden you see an amazing reversal uh, ironic, but but very telling, very eloquent reversal of all the the figure, all the all the equivalences between, let's say, biblical archetypes mm -hmm. uh, and um, and hagiographical treatments. You're welcome. Other other comments or questions, Adrian? I have one more curiosity and. Uh, I don't know how to put it. Uh, I mean, I'm going to put it in rhetorical terms, but it is connected to the, the I think it was two years ago, you showed this picture of the new reliquary, um, something like that. And I was thinking how throughout the texts, there's a lot of emphasis on, on metaphor. You know, this is like King Davis, this is like Abraham in this particular uh, passage of the uh, Old Testament. So, so the, the authority of, uh, of Nephon is basically saying, I am inhabiting the same kind of metaphorical universe yes. than before. And then once he dies, like the authority becomes metonymic. It's because, you know, his presence is there, his his hand, his, but like there is a material link to uh, throughout the history. And in this passage, I was thinking uh, of many things, but just as, I, as you know, to hear you talk about it, it's like, so what role is now that metonymic kind of politics playing right now in the context of these monasteries, in the, in the context of the Orthodox Church today? How is Nifon being re-energized and his political role as a, you know, this kind of authoritarian, uh, you know, take me or you'll die kind of situation, <laughs> right, or you'll right, pay right. for it. Uh, so how is it pay, playing right now? That's Why is it? Why is it renewed a new reliquary? Why does it need to be done again? Exactly. I was going to say it's, it's not at all accidental that all of a sudden last summer, right, you have the need to, 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 to house the, 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 the relics, the hand and the skull in a, in a, in a, in a grandiose, you know, sterling silver uh, 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 re new reliquary, right? It's, it's the same, I guess, with, uh, with, uh, with, with all important relics in, in, in Christian polities, right? They are still, in a sense, I mean, you see, you see it, it's, just, it's just incredible to see all these believers, all these Christians who still go to, to and bend the knee in front of Nifon's relics, and they regard them as, as somehow indispensable for their personal well-being, and I guess for the well-being of the political community, right? Uh, I, certainly, certainly, Niagoe made a big thing out of the of, of the two relics that he kept for himself. I I didn't mention that in return, in exchange, he sent back to the to the Dionysiou monastery his most precious relic, the skull of none other than John the Baptist, right? Which he also put in a in a in a, in a valuable relic. Pair. So he said, here. Take the skull of, of, of John the Baptist, leave with me the skull of, um, of um, and, and, and right hand of my, of my father, right, of my spiritual father and patron saint, which he 
which he adored, he venerated very publicly, very emphatically throughout his life, right? Uh, taking it with him during his military campaigns and, and you know, uh, uh, giving it a prominent place in public ceremonies, in court ceremonies, and so on and so forth. And it's not, now, of course, he himself is a saint of the Romanian church. I think as of 1989, he is sanctified. But, um, uh, but the, as far as I can tell, and I, I, I think I have a, a fairly good sense of a uh, knowledge of, of Romanian culture and Romanian realities, uh, there's no one like, no one like Nifon. And, and, and you, can, you can tell, you can feel what all the, 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 the decades and centuries of propaganda <laughs> have done to them, right? They have given, they have absolutely consolidated, solidified, crystallized his place in the, in the cultural, social, religious life of the country. And frankly, that was the, the, the goal from the very beginning. That's precisely why the Vita was written. That's precisely uh, the, 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 the purpose of all the ceremonies and the canonizations and the exhumations and the translations and so on and so forth. Mission accomplished, frankly. Well, you, 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 you have your title for your mini-series. There's no one like Nifon. There's no one like, I love it. I love, I love it. But frankly, frankly, there are, there are I don't want to say countless, there are so many examples in the early post-Byzantine period, and not just with Wallachia, uh, uh, between, with Moldavia, with Bulgaria, with Serbia. Serbia is a very important uh, tradition of its own. Right? Uh, 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 all, the, all, the, all the tributary states, or, or, or all, the, all the late, how should I put it, all the, all, the, all the medieval, the late medieval states, which were in a very close relationship with, uh, with the Byzantine Empire, and all of a sudden found themselves in a relationship, in a tributary relationship to the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire, uh, were subsumed into this kind of very intense ideological combat, as it were, precisely because the church needed, had, as part of its mission to keep them under control. And this was a very difficult thing to do, given the circumstances that necessitated, I, I think, very sustained, very programmatic, um, and yes, you know, supernatural, heavy weapon sort of thing, ideological manipulation. So it's by no means it's by no means exceptional. Nifon is by, yeah, Nifon is by no means um, uh, a, a single, a singular uh, um, example here. Well, whether he's not singular or not, I think I still think the miniseries ought to be entitled that way because you're not going to sell it by relativizing. Sure, sure, Nifon. sure, absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be the party pooper here. Uh, Thank I've been you in all class so all, much for class, being class here. and meetings all afternoon. And Nikos, I just want to thank you once again, as always, for uh, regaling us, as I as I said earlier. And uh, you, um, <clears throat> what was the old saying? You you floated like a butterfly and stung <laughs> like a bee. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you all. It was a pleasure and an honor. See you around. Bye. Thank you, Nikos. Well. Yeah.